Hey, you guys. Welcome to my channel. So I wanted to come on tonight and do um, this live video. I don't plan on being on here very long, but it's a subject that is very near and dear to me. And um, that's Black women and depression. Now, let me just go ahead and make the disclaimer because I know, you know, people, oh, everybody get depressed, not just Black women. And I agree. I agree that people of all races, ages, sexes, everyone goes through something. But with Black women, it's like we don't get to suffer from anxiety. We don't get to suffer from depression. With Black women, we, when we are going through something deep, rather than people try to understand what we're going through, it's misconstrued as we have an attitude, we're bitter, we're angry, you know, um, there's all these labels, but the one label that people love to throw on black women is the strong black woman, oh, black women, strong black women. And we are, but that label being put on us, I feel does so much more harm than good because because so many black women are often labeled and seen and viewed as strong it's like people forget that we are human we hurt too we go through things too but we have learned and been taught in society that we don't have time to slow down and just really deal you know with what we're going through we we got to keep going because nobody you know, as Malcolm X said, is more disrespected, unloved, uncared about in this world than black women. So, you know, I had my own struggles with depression. And, and I know for myself, it started at such a young age. And when I say that to people, I, I remember a, a lady told me one day as an old co-worker and I forgot what we were talking about, but she made a statement that um, said uh, something like, you know, Joyce, you probably ain't never had a, a hard day in your entire life. And I just had to look at her for a second. Um, and I didn't say what I wanted to say to her, but I, I just said, you know, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Because honestly, like I said, my issues with depression started at such a young age. And a lot of people don't like to talk about it, but as black women, sometimes our mothers and our grandmothers are the cause of a lot of our anxiety and depression issues. Now, again, if you have a very loving and caring mother who only wanted the best for you, she your best friend, that's great. That's wonderful. That's good. I actually grew up admiring that and wishing I had that. But there is a large percentage of Black women, especially, who did not have loving and caring moms. Instead, we had mothers who were fighting their own demons and fighting their own battles, you know, who had, you know, things from their past that they had not healed from or gotten any help, you know, with. And so what they did was turned around and projected their issues onto their daughters. And, you know, th there's a, a lot of us out here who know exactly what I'm talking about, having a toxic, emotionally abusive mother. And so for me, that was where a lot of my depression issues started at. Um, it started with my grandmother raised me from birth. I was um, obviously when my when my mother had me, I was told she was young and couldn't afford to take care of a child. So somehow or another, I ended up being given to my maternal uh, grandparents, which is my mom's mother and her, her husband. And my grandparents raised me from basically from a child up until I got grown and uh and moved out on my own so my grandma was like my mama to me you know and my mom she came around 
but it was a situation where she was more like a big sister to me. I always knew she was my biological mother. They never kept that from me. So I knew who my mother was, but my grandma was mama. That's who I called mama. And I called my, my granddad daddy, you know? So when I say my mama, I'm talking about my grandmother because she's biologically my grandmother. So she had her own issues. She was the oldest of, I think she said 12 kids that my great grandmama had. She was the oldest. And, you know, back in those days, it was custom for the oldest child to sometimes have to drop out of school to help take care of the siblings, which is what she had to do. I believe she said she had to drop out in like the eighth grade, very young, not even out of middle school to help take care of her other siblings. So right off the top, you know, her life, she's had to grow up. Um, basically to be an adult, even though she's a child herself. And then after helping take care of her own siblings, then she turns around, she got married. And that was when she got married to my granddad. And um, growing up, it was customary for us to see my parents fighting, arguing all the time. And sometimes to a point where police had to be called, you know, and um, I remember I used to always say when I, you know, when I get grown, when I get out, I don't ever want that to be. I don't want this kind of marriage. I don't want this, this kind of family, all this fighting and this, that and the other. Well, my grandma, well, my mama, she was a Jehovah's Witness. OK, and Jehovah's Witnesses have a whole different mindset, a whole different belief system. And as a child, I, I I didn't like particularly going to the Kingdom Hall. But, you know, in those days, again, I, I, I was born in 1978, so I grew up in the 80s, teenager in the 90s. So in those days, it wasn't no I don't want to do. It's you do what your mama tells you to do. So if this is the church, she's telling me, you know, this is, this is where we're going. And I ain't got no choice but to go. But I grew up, you know, with their belief system of they don't celebrate birthdays and holidays and some of that. Now, my granddad, my grandma's husband, who was not a Jehovah's Witness, she married him before she became a Jehovah's Witness. So we were still able to kind of celebrate some things at home because he was the man of the house. He made the money. She was a homemaker. He made all the money. So, you know, if he wanted holidays in his house, fine. But there were just a lot of other things besides holidays that I didn't really, even at a young age, I just, I didn't identify with, I didn't agree with some of the Jehovah's Witnesses um, beliefs and some of their the, the, the things that they do. I just remember thinking, this just don't seem right to me. And I, I may be young, but this, is a, this ain't it for me. This is not a religion that if I had a choice to choose, that I would choose. And, but again, you know, I had to go because that's where she told me to go. But as I started to get older, I started to get into high school. I start realize that, realizing that I'm missing out on a lot of things. I can't be in extracurricular activities because they don't believe in that. I can't, you know, go to, you know, school dances and stuff like that because they don't believe in that. Um, socializing, you know, with, with people who aren't, Jehovah's Witnesses. Now I'm getting into high school and I'm feeling like life is passing me by and I'm missing out on so much stuff that I could and, and, and want to be doing because this religion is being forced on me. So as I start to get older, you know, when you start to get a teenager, you start to get a little bit more rebellious and, you know, yeah, she telling me I got to go, but she can't make me like it. You know, you can make me go, but I don't like it. You can't force me to participate. And, and it got to a point where I'd stopped, you know, participating in their Bible studies and all this. I would just go and just, just sit and basically watch the clock or just whatever. And so she started to notice. And I remember the first time she threatened me and she said, well, you know, I don't know what your issue is, your problem is, but you don't, uh, you don't talk to folks. You don't say you just, you know, you just sit there like you don't want to be there because I don't. You know, of course, I didn't say that because you just slapped the mouth back then. But, you know, I didn't want to be there. 
Um, so she basically was like, well, if you don't participate tonight in Bible study, you know, you, you see what you get when you get home. And we know that mean a whooping. And it was like one of those situations where I was like, dang, this lady finna threaten me just because I ain't talking. Like that, that just made me hate it that much more that you're already forcing me to do it. But now you're threatening me with a whooping or with punishment just because I don't want to be there. That just made me even that more, much more resentful of the kingdom hall and of her for forcing this on me and I almost was to a point where I was willing to accept I was, I was just going to take that whooping I really was um, but um, that was where the beginning of my issues with my grandma started because for one I think she had carved out this whole life that she wanted me to have and I was you know in high school now and starting to realize that there's there's things I want to do I don't want to be a Jehovah's Witness for one I, I don't want to do you know I don't want to follow my grandma's footsteps I had my own I wanted to go to college I wanted to be a teacher I've always loved English I wanted to be a middle school English teacher you know so I had my own goals and plans for the future that did not include what she wanted me to do now, I don't know if you know anything about Jehovah's Witnesses, but they have this thing about disfellowship. And if, you know, if, if you mess around and, and quit going or get kicked, I don't know exactly what you have to do to get disfellowship. But it's almost to a point where, like, they have to shun even their own family members if they're not Jehovah's Witnesses. And I feel like when I got to the point, I believe it was right before my senior year of high school, I started working after school at this pizza joint. So now I'm working, I'm making money. I don't have time to, you know, go to the Kingdom Hall. I don't have time to, you know, go door to door like they do on Saturday mornings. I got to work now. And that didn't sit well with my grandma, but she finally was like, well, you know, you don't want to go fine. You don't want to serve the Lord fine. You know, she threw a guilt trip on me, but I could just almost immediately tell that that was the turning point. It was almost like she stopped caring for me, um, or at least I felt it, um, because I wasn't doing what she had planned for me to do. And so there was a shift in the relationship with her. Now, I'm in my last year of school and I'm doing well. I'm, I'm thinking I'm proud of me. You know, I'm, I'm thinking a parent would be proud. I'm going to school every day. I'm uh, going to, to work after school. I'm making my own money. I'm not having to ask, you know, my grandparents to pay for anything for me. I'm really being a responsible young adult. And on top of that, on the honor roll, making good grades, you know, getting praise and stuff from teachers. And I'm thinking a parent would be happy about that but she was anything but happy as a matter of fact she had like she really just couldn't care less about anything I had going on when it came to school or anything like that so you know when you're when you when you're close to graduation you have a lot of career days and this that and the other and um, usually the military recruits will come and a whole bunch of girls from my class, you know, was wanting to sign up to join the military, me and myself included. You know, it was really just something for me to do. And I signed up. And so the military recruiter called my house one morning and I didn't even get to the phone. I heard my grandma um, telling the recruiter who had asked to speak to me. I heard her say something like, um, you don't need to call here no more because uh, Joyce ain't going to no army. She, she ain't going to no military. And like I said, I didn't even get to the phone, but in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I mean, I wanted to talk to him. How, how, you know how she just going to tell him, don't call here like she made the choice for me. I didn't even get to talk to the man on the phone. And he did not call back no more. And I just remember thinking, okay, no, nah, this, this is not cool. Like, she don't get to make those choices for me. Like, she really 
just told this man, no, nah, that ain't happening. So I had had no choice but to let her ruin that for me. But um, so now I, I really didn't have any concrete plans. I knew what I wanted to do. Like I said, yes, I wanted to go to college and be a teacher. But for me, that was a fantasy. That was a dream. Because in my household, nobody had ever gone to college. It wasn't even talked about in my household. I didn't know anything about financial aid or Pell Grants or student loans. Even I didn't know that that was like foreign conversation to me. Um, I had never heard anything about it. I just always assumed that people who went to college were rich. Their parents had a lot of money, you know, and, and that's how they got to go. And I knew mine didn't have that. So, yes, going to college was a dream, but it was one of those things that seemed so far fetched for me that it was just it was a dream. It was a fantasy. If I could do anything, that's what I want to do. But realistically. What am I really going to do after high school? Well, that's why I had thought, okay, go to the military. Well, she just ruined that for me. So now what? Well, it just so happens that, like I said, I wasn't no dummy. I was making A's and B's on a roll. And a lot of the other women in the community, from the librarian, I lived in the library all the time, to the hairdresser, to teachers, they were all like, Joyce, you're such a bright young girl. You know, what are you going to do with yourself after high school? I don't know. That was always my answer. I don't know. Get a job somewhere, I guess. And they would say, well, why aren't you going to college? And I was actually kind of too ashamed to even say, my family's poor. We don't got we don't no money to go to college, you know. <laughs> and so um, it was actually other people who started saying, girl, you know, there's ways around. Ain't nobody family got money like that but they're you know they started telling me all about the financial aid you know and and and, and Pell grants and I'm just like really like the first time I ever heard any of this and then I realized that okay my fantasy my dream is now a real possibility you telling me this can actually happen and things started getting set in motion I had one lady bring me the financial aid packet I filled it out sent it back in and before long I was getting a, a letter in the mail saying congratulations you know you was a fool approved for this federal Pell grant and how much it was and you know it's gonna cover books and tuition and I'm just ecstatic I'm just elated like oh my gosh you know, like you know maybe being a teacher ain't so far fetched it's something I can really do and I'm excited because I get a chance to make something of myself do something with myself. And again, you thinking or I'm thinking that my mama and my grandma are going to be proud of me. I couldn't have been more wrong. I got to talking to her one day about going to college. And, you know, I had already been approved for everything. So I, I was really just kind of running it by her. And the way this lady turned around and looked at me is one of those things that I think to this day I will never forget. It was the most blank stare. It was this look of hatred, just everything. And um, I remember we were standing in the laundry room of our house and I was telling her, you know, oh, I got approved for, you know, this much money to go to college and blah, blah, blah. And she looked at me just, it was like she looked through me. And um, she said, um, you know, you, you would have to act like you better than the rest of us. You know, ain't none of my other kids never, you know, went to no damn college. Uh, all the rest of my kids went, went to that old chicken plant and got them that good job at that chicken plant. Now, let me tell you about the chicken plant, okay? Tyson poultry chicken plant. And if you ever worked there, then you know what I'm talking about. Tyson Foods is, I guess in her mind, was a good job. It's dirty. It's it's filthy. It's, it's eight hours, sometimes more, of standing almost elbow to elbow on a production line, deboning or whatever you're doing to, to the chicken as it comes down the line. And in her eyes, that was such a great job. And I'm just like, so, you know, I, I'm trying to process that 
you are telling me that I'm not, the way I heard it was her saying, who the fuck do you think you are? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say the F word. Who do you think you are to go to some college? You know, you ain't no better than the rest and to go to the chicken plant. So in my mind, all I'm hearing is her saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. That the only thing she feels I'm good enough for is to go to this chicken plant and work, this poultry plant and work. And she was angry at me because I wasn't wanting to settle for that, you know, and I couldn't for the life of me. I think my mouth just kind of dropped open because, you know, of course, like I said, you can't talk back to your parents in them days. You get your teeth knocked out, you know, but be picking your, your face up off the floor. But I, I was just like in shock because it was like the level of anger and hatred and everything she had for me. Just because I said I wanted to go make something with myself, go to school. And I'm like, she acting like I said I wanted to. Go stand on the street corner and and and, and sell ass for a living. I'm actually talking about going to school and 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 making something that I didn't understand where her level of hatred and anger was coming from. And so she continued, you know, on with, you know, like I said, I, I think I'm better than everybody else. And what she had done in that moment was she had planted a seed in my mind that I was never supposed to outshine or do better than anybody else, you know, in the family. And I, I just remember looking back on it, that that was the exact moment that I started holding myself back, that I started keeping myself in check. Anytime I did something I had to be careful not to be too happy or, or brag about it too much because it's going to make somebody else mad. I had to basically learn in that moment to start dimming my own light so that I didn't outshine somebody else, that I didn't step on somebody else's toes because that really hurt me to my core when she said I thought I was better than the rest of the family. And it's like, that's not true at all. But if I have a, a, a choice, a chance to try to go do something else, where's the harm in doing that? You know, again, I, I didn't understand where her anger came from because most parents will be happy, proud as hell that they child want to go to school and make something of themselves. And she went on to tell me that she's like, you better not ask me for a dime. I ain't got no money for no damn college. And I was saying, mama, I'm not asking you for money. I'm telling you, you know, it, I don't even have to pay. It's, it's all covered in this Pell Grant that I got. So basically, it's like I go to school for free because I was just going to go to the um, two-year junior college and do my first two years and then transfer to a four-year university. So I'm just going to a, a two-year junior college. So I don't have to pay for any of this. Basically, it's free. So I'm not asking you for any money, you know, and but she she didn't want to hear nothing else. I could tell she had no interest at all. And again, it was like the level of how it hurt me that she didn't want to have anything to do with me, my dreams, my ideas, my goals, because it did not align with what she wanted me to do, which was to be a Jehovah's Witness. And so, again, that was where my relationship with her, it was basically just kind of broken. Like, you know, I was a, now I'm a, a part-time college student and I'm still working. So I'm working my way through college. So of course I can't afford to move out. And it just seems like the more I stayed in the house with her, the more depressed I got, like I could literally feel her anger, her hatred, her annoyance at me. I almost like could see it in her eyes. So I try to stay away. You know, I try to stay gone or, or stay back in my room because it just seemed like she would just find any excuse in the world to pick with me, to argue with me, to you know, anything. So then I started dating. Um, he's now my son's father. 
But I started dating him. And once she did not approve of that relationship, it was like, again, she started trying to sabotage it. You know, first it was he can't call my house. Okay, well, again, this is still in like the 90s, 96 or so. So, all right, well, I'll go to the payphone and I'll call him. Well, then he can't even come to my house. Okay, well, I'll just go meet him somewhere. Go, you know, I go over somebody else's house or because we lived in, in different towns. I just go up the street or, or, or something. It was like she was doing everything she could to, I guess, break us up. I don't know because, like I said, she got to a point where she didn't approve. At first, she loved him to death, but then, I don't know, she decided that she didn't like him. So it was like, well, you're not going to have him either. Well, the thing about that was, yes, he was a very toxic guy. But the way she was acting and her trying to control me and, you know, the, the way she was treating me with so much anger and resentment, all she was really doing was pushing me closer to him, you know. In her mind, maybe she thought, I'm doing her a favor, you know, by, by trying to keep her away from him. But she's not understanding that you're not giving me the things I need as a mom, which is emotional love, support, all of that stuff that I need from you as a mother. You, I'm not getting that from you. All I'm getting is hatred, anger, resentment, bitterness, you know, fuss that, cuss that every time I, I, I turn around. So really, you're just pushing me further into his arms. So. He's knowing exactly what to do, how to act, whatever. To So I, I really felt like I was in the middle, just in a tug of war, you know, between the two of them. So I'm 18 now, and it's it was really one of the most depressing times. Because like I said, at home, I feel unloved. I feel uncared about. I feel unwanted. I feel unseen, unheard. Then I'm with this boyfriend who... Like I said, yes, he's also being emotionally abusive, started out emotionally abusive, went to verbally uh, abusive. And, you know, that eventually trickles down to physical abuse, which luckily it didn't get there by the time he got to where he won't start trying to you know, put his hands on me and stuff. I, it was over. But um, I was just the most unhappiest. 18 year old girl even though from the outside looking in people probably thought I had again everything was great you know I wasn't no ugly girl I was slim trim had a nice little shape you know had a bunch of dudes always you know turning head but I was still so unhappy I would smile and laugh and talk and joke and everything but at home I was just so miserable and unhappy. And um, because like I said, it was just like I, I truly felt unloved. Did nobody care about me? And then with my grandma acting the way she was acting, my self-esteem, my sense of self-worth, everything just basically took a huge nose dive because I every time all I kept hearing was her basically saying, You ain't good enough for nothing other than that chicken plant. You who do you think you are that you so I mean that really it held me back because you know when my grades started to slip and I, I'm just gonna be 100% real my first semester of college I think I was already on academic probation but then again everybody freshman year fall semester y'all know we was all proud of wilding out it's, it's a whole different experience <laughs> I was on like academic probation like the first semester but it was also a lot that was going on you know, at home, it's hard to focus. It's hard to, you know, to study when, when I'm, I'm feeling all of this animosity and, you know, everything around me. And so that was the first time that I believe I became suicidal. I was 18. Like I said, I'm still with my, my son. Well, he, he wasn't my son's father at the time. He is now at the time. He's just my boyfriend. We had this fight and, um, it was a bad, it was a bad fight. <laughs> and I came home crying in tears. And my grandma meets me at the door. And instead of um kind words or comforting words, it was um it was mocking, it was belittling, it was fussing and cussing. I'm talking, about, I hadn't even got in the door good. 
and um, she's already going off on me about being so stupid. And again, the whole thing about me being in college, I don't know why that bothered her so much, but I will never forget her saying, you know, huh, you, you're supposed to be little Miss College girl. You know, you little college girls, but you're going to let this, 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 this boy beat up on you. You're going to let this boy. And I just remember kind of thinking, what does me being in college have to do with this moment? You know, me being in, in, in college ain't got nothing to do with right now. But she would use that to throw it in my face. It don't matter what it was. That was hmm. You're supposed to know better, little Miss Cottage girl. You're supposed to know. And it was just like the mocking, the belittling, the the fussing, the cussing. I'm standing there and I'm taking it and I'm taking it. And I just remember that I just felt just baroque. I was just hollow inside. And I went into my room and I just sat on the side of the bed and I just cried because I'm thinking this woman hates me just this much. She hate me just that much that she didn't even have a comforting word to say. She didn't even ask me was I okay. She didn't ask me was I all right. She just went straight into just going. And, and I just remember thinking nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. My mama don't love me. My, my grandma don't love me. Mama gave me away. You know, she didn't love me. Now my grandma got me. She hates me. Now I'm with this dude. He hates me. You know, I, I really just kind of started to feel maybe I just do everybody a favor if I was just gone. And so that was the first time, like I said, at 18, that I contemplated wishing I could just, you know, not be here anymore. And it was more pain. You know, when people are going through pain, it's, they just want the pain to stop. You don't necessarily want to to die or to not be here you just don't want to hurt no more and so from 18 all the way up until my 40s I was secretly and privately battling with these depressive issues these suicidal thoughts there were several more times during those years where something bad would happen and I would just go to this dark place and I would immediately go to thinking I would just do everybody a favor I think if I just wasn't here but it was just something that just kept you know every time I would even think about it I, I even had a suicide attempt um where I when my kid now now I'm grown I have kids I had a nine-year-old son a three-year-old daughter and I'm in yet another toxic relationship with another man. And I just remember I was home alone one day. Actually, I was on a break from work. And I went home and I dumped a bottle of pills in my hand and I swallowed them all. And uh, my kids were with my sister because, again, I'm still at work. I was just on a break. And I swallowed all those pills and then I just laid down on the couch. And I vaguely remember calling my job because I'm like, okay, no way am I going back to work. Now I remember that I called my job and my boss answered. He was this black dude. And he answered and I said, <clears throat> I'm not going to be coming back into work today. And he said, why? And I said, because I just swallowed a whole bottle of pills. And he said, you did what? And and I, I didn't even answer. I hung the phone up and I just laid on the couch and really expected that I was not going to wake up anymore. And I mean, no, that wasn't what I wanted to do. I thought about my kids. I thought about, but it was just, I had lived up until that point, a, a life of nothing but hurt, pain. And I just wanted pain to stop. And I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought I ain't going to wake up from this no more. And what woke me up was this loud banging. And what the banging was, was my sister banging on the door, bringing my kids back home. And so I didn't even realize it was so many hours later. And so I got up to let the kids, but I was so weak. The room was spinning 
I was just weak. And I didn't tell my sister what I had done. I just said, okay, you know, thank you for bringing the kids home. And I locked the door and fell back onto the couch. And I remember my daughter, you know, was saying, mommy, I'm hungry. And I was just so weak. I couldn't even, I couldn't even try to get up. I fall back down, get up. And my son, he was nine. And I remember, you know, saying, can, can you please just go, you know, he just listed something up in the microwave or, you know, mom, I just can't do it right now. And I, my son has always, he's been there with me. He's seen me at some of my worst days and just the way he stepped up and he went and he, you know, he threw something in the microwave for his sister. And then he came back into the living room and I was laid back on the couch again. And I remember he grabbed his blanket and he put the blanket over me. And it was just like all those nights when I have tucked him in. Now he's like tucking me in. I just remember thinking my baby, you know, my, my baby boy is taking care of me. And I have to get better because I can't leave my kids in this world. You know what I'm saying? They all I got, I'm all they got. So I, I have to, something got to give, something got to happen. But I can't do this again because my babies need me. And I definitely need, as a matter of fact, my kids were really the only things that saved me, that saved my life, that kept me because they were the only things that brought me joy. And so I, it was like God was saying, nope, you know, it ain't your time yet. Because all of a sudden I got that feeling of I had to throw up. And that was all those pills coming back up. And I jumped up and made it as far as the kitchen because I was I was closer to the kitchen than I was the bathroom. And I made it to the trash can right in the nick of time. And I threw all those pills up. It seemed like I threw up forever. And <laughs> I felt like death really throwing all those pills up. I did. But that was when I realized, okay, Joyce, you you got to you you got to do better, like you you know. But it was just the fact that I was struggling with this and couldn't tell anybody, you know, because again, I had took on that label of being this strong black woman, as as most black women do, and I just had to be on go mode. I had to be a mom, a single mom, raising kids. I didn't have time to really sometimes sit down and worry about myself, worry about my own issues. I had to make sure my kids were okay. So a lot of us Black women, that's what we do. We push our own hurts, fears, everything. We push them, you know, to the back of our mind and we simply do what we got to do because we ain't got no choice. And um, so while I'm being superwoman and super mom and, you know, taking care of everything, my mental health was just struggling. My mental health was just <laughs> a dumpster fire, to to be honest. And but I didn't have time. I was very, uh, very much a high functioning depressive person. When you're a high functioning de depressive person, then you're able to go about your day. You able to carry on, go to work, be productive, be this superwoman, superman, all the while you crying any chance you get alone. I was going in the bathroom a lot of times and crying my eyes out. I was going to bed every night crying my eyes out and then wake up the next morning like, okay, you know, I, you cried all night. You got to put your game face on now, you know, and, and I would put that smile on. My smile was, was my mask, you know. Um, I would just smile to cover up all my hurt, my pain, I would smile and laugh. And again, people never knew that I was going through what I was going through because I didn't tell anybody about it. Because again, you know, especially in the black community, there's this misconception that if you go to therapy, you know, oh, you crazy. Oh, yeah, you crazy. And nobody wants to be called or made to feel, you know, crazy or weird or like there's something wrong with you. You know, a lot of black people don't believe in therapy. They believe, you know, you just gotta take care of you cannot pray depression away. Yes, you know, prayer and all of that is great, but 
when you are as depressed as I was and going through, you know, anxiety issues and stuff like I was, that's something that church and the Bible and, and God can't get rid of that. But, you know, a lot of black people, they don't think that they think that, you know, all it takes is you going to church or 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 praying. So it was something that I just kept to myself. I didn't even talk to anybody about it or tell anybody about it because I didn't want the whispers, the stares. I didn't want to be made to feel even worse if I broke down and admitted that, you know what I'm saying? I've contemplated suicide a couple of times. I've, you know, struggled with, you know, I, I didn't even want that. And so I would just mask it with my smile, being the superwoman that I was, being the super mom that I was, being the strong black woman that I was. But like I said, that label was really hindering me. It was keeping me from growing because as long as I was telling myself, I'm a strong black woman, I'm a strong black woman, then that made me keep thinking, you don't need to get no type of help, you know, just do what you've been doing. And so I think that a lot of times when people, you know, tell black women, you know, you're just strong black women, a strong black woman, I feel like they're just telling us, oh, just deal with it, you know, just deal with it. That's what y'all do. And so a lot of us feel like we can't get help or we don't even need to get help because we're managing. And just because you're managing, like I said, you're high functioning. You're still going to work every day. You still, you know, out here getting degrees and, and getting married and, and going on, you know, trips and vacations and doing everything. So, hey, you know, I'm cool. But when you get alone, you get by yourself. It's like then that's when, you know, what I'm saying those issues come back. So it took me all the way up until I was in my 40s. I'm 44 now. And it was actually in 2020, right when COVID started. And I had had another breakdown. And that was when I finally said, okay, Joyce, you cannot put this off any longer. You have put this off for more than 20 years. It is time. And I took myself to a mental health uh, facility in, in, in the town that I lived in. And... Um, I just told the lady, I, I need I need some help. I need, you know, um, therapy. And so, you know, um, they do their initial, you know, sort of uh, talking to you, you know, to, to find out what exactly is going on with you, you know, to determine what type of help, you, you know, you do need. And so it's like an evaluation. And I remember that when they finally called me back, um, and so the, the lady, she, you know, she's like, oh, you know, have a seat. And it was everything I kind of, you know, we kind of think therapy is laying on the couch and <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I remember so many times saying, oh, I just need to go lay on somebody's couch. So when I was finally in an office, I wasn't laying on the couch, but I was in a, in a nice comfy chair. And I remember, um, the lady asking me, she was like, okay, so tell me what's going on. You know, tell me what brought you here. And before I'm talking about, I wasn't even two or three good minutes in and I was boohooing and bawling my eyes out trying to tell this woman everything. And, and it was because I had held it in. Like I said, I, this is something that I've carried this stuff with me for 20 years or more. And to finally be able to get it out and tell somebody that I didn't feel was going to judge me or make me feel stupid or make me feel I was crying before I could even get halfway through. And, but the one thing I do remember is talking about my issues with my grandmother and how she had basically emotionally neglected and abandoned me um, right as I was hitting high school and how my relationship with her had suffered so much over the years. She had said so many hurtful, disgusting, degrading, demeaning things to me. And so her words really shaped the way I saw myself. I didn't think that I was worthy of love. I didn't think that 
I could accomplish anything because again, who am I? I'm just a girl in her mind that, that's only worth working at a chicken plant. You know, I'm not supposed to do anything to feel proud of myself or whatever, because I can't, you know, outshine or, or, or whatever anybody else in the family. So it was just like all that stuff I had been carrying with me. And um, I was in there for more than an hour. She just let me talk. And um, then she finally, you know, said, OK, well, we're going to get you set up with um, a therapist and we'll start some sessions. And again, when I finally got to the lady who would become my therapist, uh, for the next two years, again, before I could even get to talking to her, I'm already crying and booing. And she she just listened. She gave me some tissues, but she listened. And then she told me, she said, you are suffering from a lot of emotional abuse you've taken. And people don't understand emotional abuse sometimes can be far worse than somebody punching you in the face because a bruise will heal. But people's words and the things that they say, you know, people used to say, oh, words don't hurt. That is a lie. Words absolutely do hurt. I'm still to this day at 44 cringing sometimes at the words people said to me when I was 17 years old because it lingers. It stays with you. And um, so I was officially diagnosed by my therapist as suffering from PTSD from the emotionally abusive relationships that I had been in um, with depression and anxiety. And um, so her treatment plan for me basically was to, um, to help me get a better thought process because she said, we have got to change your way of thinking because she said, I can see that you don't think that you are worthy of love, of grace, of any of the things that you've always tried to give other people. You don't think that you're deserving of it yourself. And we need to change that. So, you know, a lot of my therapy was a lot of uh, cognitive, you know, changing your your thought process and, you know, stop feeling like you you have to sit back and, and take care of everybody else, but don't take care of yourself. Stop feeling like you're not worthy of love. Stop feeling like you're not worthy of accomplishments and, and, and being proud of your accomplishments because you are. So, you know, like I say, yeah, it took me a good two years. Um, but it finally worked. It, it worked great. And so I say that to say, do not do what I did and wait 20 years before you decide to take care of your mental health. As soon as you feel it, as soon as you get those thoughts, find you somebody to talk to. If you can't find a friend, a relative, a coworker, whoever, do what I did. I, I put myself in therapy. I didn't even wait for somebody else. I finally walked into that office on my own and said, this is, I need some help. So I think a big thing is we need to stop being ashamed black women we need to for one get out from underneath that strong black woman label because it hinders us it makes us think that you know i, I can i can I take on anything we, we shouldn't have to take on any and everything so get out from underneath that strong black woman label and then if you feel like you need the help go get it forget what people gonna say people gonna talk about you regardless forget what people gonna say they're going to call you crazy. They're going to call you whatever. But you know what? In this day and time that we live in, everybody got something wrong. Everybody got some form of, of, of mental health issue or, or something that they're battling. So I wouldn't even let somebody make me feel bad, you know, anymore about saying I need therapy. That's It takes a lot of strength to be able to do that. I remember that when I first started going, they were going to diagnose me with um, not diagnose me. They were going to get me set up on some sleeping pills and some anxiety pills because my depression would keep me up sometimes at night. And I, I was never the person who ever wanted to, um, do antidepressants because sometimes those can do more harm than good. And so I remember the lady who called, um, telling me, you know, what pills she was recommending for me. And she was just talking to me. And um, she said, 
I absolutely cannot believe that you have carried this pain, this hurt with you for 20 plus years. And she said, I don't even know you, but I am rooting for you because I can tell that you are one strong lady to have been through the things that you've been through, your suicidal issues, but you still here. And she said, it takes a lot of strength and a lot of growth to have walked yourself in here and admit it. You know what I'm saying? I know that had to take a lot and it did because again, I had gotten so accustomed to, again, strong black woman. I don't let nobody see me cry. I don't let nobody see me sweat. I got everything under control, you know? So you get used to doing that. And she said, I'm rooting for you. And I really, really hope that, you know, everything will work out. And like I said, I never wanted to get hooked on those pills. So I think I took the anxiety pills maybe once or twice. And I never did take the sleeping pills. And I was able to just, beat my depression by not taking the medication. Now, I can't recommend that for everybody else. But like I said, I did not want to get hooked on sleeping pills or antidepressants because sometimes, you know, if you do your research, those may not always help. Some of them are, are even worse for you. So it took sheer strength and determination and just willpower that I was going to get better, that I was going to do better. And that meant First of all, getting my mental health in check. And so going to therapy for me saved my life. And it was one of the best decisions that I think I ever made. So I am the first person that's always going to tell someone, if you need to go to therapy, please do yourself a favor and go because it saved me. And yes, going to therapy, I did have to address and my therapist actually confirmed the the mama issues really that I had. And she did say that, you know, your your mom sort of, well, your grandma, you know, she she emotionally neglected and abandoned you. And that's what led to you being, you know, this person. You know, when you're uh when you're not getting what you need, you become a a people pleaser. And that's what I was. And essentially kind of like a doormat. I used to would let people walk all over me because I was afraid of people leaving me, of being alone, of being rejected, you know, again, because I already felt so rejected once in my life from the, the person who was supposed to love me most. And that's my grandma. So I would bend over backwards, you know, trip all over myself trying to please people to make them stay. And um, so, you know, she helped me to to work through those issues. And once I realized where that came from, why I was that way, then it, it was easy for me to now get into a habit of saying, okay, I don't care. Even if I got to be by myself, I'm not doing this. I'm not letting nobody treat me any kind of way. I'm not letting nobody talk to me any kind of way. I don't care who it is. You know what I'm saying? But I just, I just want my, my black women to understand that we can be strong, but, um, we also need to do what we have to do to get our mental health in check because so many people are committing suicide, especially black women and successful black women, people that you would look at and you wouldn't even think, you know, that they had an issue and people are out here suffering from depression and silence because they don't want to be judged. They don't feel like they can talk to anybody. And I don't want that to be something that continues. So depression is, is an issue that is very near and dear to me because I done struggled with it myself. I done had to work through it myself. I've dealt with it with both of my kids and went through their own depressive issues. So, you know, trying to help them to go through it. Don't let anyone especially black, white, whoever, but especially my black women, take good care of yourself. And I didn't mean to be on here a whole hour, <laughs> but like I said, this is a subject that I can really talk about all day because, you know, every day almost you turn around and you see somebody that you would never expect 
has committed suicide. For instance, um, what was the lady's name? I can't think of her name. She was the beauty queen. She was Miss, um, was she Miss USA? That uh, was from New York. And they, they say, you know, that she committed suicide by what, jumping out of the, the window? Like, you know, that just, my mouth just dropped. But again, having been gone through that, that high de functioning depression was like, wow, I hate that sis couldn't, you know, get, get a handle on that. But I've been there, done that. You know, you got athletes, you have movie stars, you have Purdue. I mean, so many people are out here, um, you know, killing themselves because they feel like that's their only option. And so I wish more people would talk about it. Don't be ashamed to talk about it. I used to be so embarrassed to even want to admit any of this to anybody. You know, I didn't want people looking at me like, oh, she, cried. you know, so I would just hold it in. But we got to get out of that being embarrassed. You know, because the, the first step for me was opening my mouth and admitting it out loud. And so once you can do that, then you can be on the path to getting whatever help it is, you know, that you need. So I'm going to go ahead and end it and get off of here because again, whew, I'm 56 minutes in. Um, but I would love to hear comments below like you know I'm I'm the person that's gonna say I'm always here I understand all too well I think that's the the impact in me and again because um I've gone through it I I would rather listen to somebody vent or tell me whatever it is they need to tell me than to you know get on social media one day and hear that someone else has decided you know killing themselves was the only way that they could get out of, you know, the, the depressive stage that they were in. So don't forget to uh, leave me some comments below. Tell me, but have, have you struggled or someone you love struggled? I would love to hear about it. Don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel. And I'm going to go ahead and just say good night. Please take care of yourself. Like I said, everybody, white, black, male, female, get some help if you need it and take care of yourself. But especially to my black women, to my sisters. We got to take care of us, y'all, because really at the end of the day, we kind of all we got. So we need to take care of us the best way we can. I love you all. And I'm going to say good night. Bye.